Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. Shortly after MB Games released Hero Quest, Games Workshop released a game called Advanced Hero Quest. But really, apart from being set in the same location, Games Workshop's old world, and apart from being able to use all of your Hero Quest components in Advanced Hero Quest, it really was a completely different game system. But many years later, in 2003, when Dungeons & Dragons was in its 3.5 edition, when Hasbro owned MB Games and Parker, they released another game that to me really does feel like Advanced Hero Quest. And that game is the Dungeons & Dragons Fantasy Adventure board game, and that's the game we're going to take a look at today. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, they never released this game in the United States. And that is a shame, because this is a really nice game. Arguably, a better game than Hero Quest. Although for me personally, Hero Quest wins out because of the setting, because of the nostalgia relating to it. This game obviously eschews Games Workshop's IP and instead sets the game in the world of Dungeons and Dragons. And there are a lot of recognisable elements from 3.5 edition that fans of role playing games will recognise. And it keeps the same basic structure of Hero Quest. You have four heroes, although they are now heroes lifted from the classes of Dungeons and Dragons. And then you have a fifth player who is the Dungeon Master. The Dungeon Master has a map which shows them where monsters and traps are. The heroes will explore, gradually revealing new areas, attempting to complete whatever objective the quest has for them. And in total, there are 11 quests in the box and they are strung together into a loose campaign. You can pick and choose which mission you want to play. But the idea is you play them in sequence. And there are other elements that are similar to Hero Quest. There's opening treasure chests, searching for traps and disarming them, and obviously fighting lots of monsters. But it has a more elaborate combat system. It has lots of different items and spells, and generally much more for the players to think about in any given turn. So while it's not a complicated game, while it's not a deep game, it does have levels on top of Hero Quest. It does lose a few things that Hero Quest has. There is no longer any searching for secret doors. And apart from a few stand up pillars and trees, you don't get a lot of nice furniture to decorate your dungeon with. But in this video today, I'm going to very quickly run through how the game plays. And that's in preparation for a playthrough video, which will be coming up on the channel a little bit later. In Dungeons & Dragons, the fantasy adventure board game, there will always be four heroes. If you have less than five players in total, then some players will have to take on the role of multiple characters. And the characters are a little more interesting and involved than the characters that you find in Hero Quest. Here we have a character sheet for one of the heroes, Jozan the Human Cleric. There is also an elven wizard, a halfling rogue, and a human fighter in the set. And then later on they introduce two more heroes through expansions, which are ridiculously hard to find and I would love to be able to get hold of them. In fact, to be honest, if Hasbro would like to do a reprint of this game the same way they did with Hero Quest, I think it would be a wonderful thing, but I digress. Here we have Jozan. And first of all you can see we have two trackers. We have spell points up this side, and then up the other side we have hit points. And you will notice they are divided into three sections. We have level 1, and then level 2, and then level three. And that's because, as in Dungeons and Dragons, your heroes can level up. But this isn't something that you do through the earning of experience points or anything like that. It's just something that naturally happens as you progress through the campaign. The first four missions are all level one, so you start level one in all of those missions. But then once you get to mission five, it's a level two quest. So you upgrade your character to all of the level two stats and you get all of the level two starting items. And then again, once you get to the later missions, you become level three. It just automatically happens to scale up your heroes in line with the challenges they're facing. So obviously the hit point tracker tracks how many wounds you have. It will go down every time you take damage. It will go up every time you're healed, capping out at the level that you are currently at. The spell tracker is the number of spell points you have, and that dictates how many times you can cast certain spells. Unlike Hero Quest, where spells are one use, you can use the same spell over and over again in this game, as long as you have the spell points to cast it. You'll also see we have three stats. We have movement. No longer are we rolling 2d6 here. We have a fixed movement of five points for this character. We have an armor class, which is two. I will talk more about that when we deal with combat in a moment. And then the third icon is the number of items you can carry in your knapsack, which are stored on the right-hand side of your character card. On the left-hand side of the character card, you can also see there are three slots. We have weapons, 
artifacts and spells and we can see that Jozan can carry a maximum of one weapon one artifact and one spell ready for use at any one time everything else has to go in his knapsack and it will cost him an action to swap things from his knapsack into his hand to use he also has two special actions which are listed at the bottom one is he can turn undead again that's something we will talk about in a moment and the other thing he can do is heal this is something he can always do in addition to casting spells although it does cost him one spell point for each hit point he restores to himself or an adjacent ally and at the start of the game each player selects a character and then you look at the level of the dungeon you're entering so level one two or three and then you get a set loadout of starting items depending on that level in the case of Jozan he gets two items he gets one spell and one weapon the spell he gets is greater restoration and we can see by looking at this symbol here that this spell costs four spell points for a cleric to cast that is the cleric symbol some spells will also have a wizard symbol with a different value inside it because sometimes the spells can be used by multiple classes but sometimes they are not as effective with certain classes as they are with others in this particular case this is a spell only for clerics and we can see it is called Greater Restoration and it says you can bring a hero back from the dead and restore them to four hit points and to four spell points if possible. Stand next to the dead hero to restore them, single use per adventure. And we would place that next to Jozan's character card like that. He also gets a starting weapon. You can see it's a level one weapon, it says up there. You can see it is a ranged weapon because it has a crossbow symbol up here. It is called the Crossbow of Faith and it says it is strengthened with Pelor's runes to fly straight and true. And then at the bottom, we have the amount of damage it causes. Every time you attack with this weapon, you will be rolling two yellow dice and then the special star dice. We will talk more about these dice in a moment when we deal with combat. But you will also see when you attack with this bow, if you roll that special dice and roll the star symbol, you can restore spell points. And that's how you can stay active and keep casting those spells. And we will place that card there. We are now ready to enter the dungeon. Oh, and if you wanted a close look at the miniature for this character, here it is. The miniatures for this game have a really chunky, distinct style, which I like a lot, but it does make them a little bit hard to introduce into other games because they look a little bit cartoonish. Here we have our sample dungeon. The dungeons are created in advance by the dungeon master. They will lay out all of the tiles, but they don't put anything in the tiles except for doors in the starting room. And there are five tiles total and they are double sided so there's quite a lot of variation in how the maps can be laid out the heroes are placed in the starting area and they must select one hero to open the door to bravely advance into the first area where there may be danger and at that point you have to determine initiative the game comes with five initiative cards numbered one through five and every time the heroes open a door you have to shuffle up these initiative cards and deal one to each character and one to the dungeon master. You don't look at what number you have received at that moment. The dungeon master will then reveal everything that is in the room except for of course traps which are kept secret as they are in Hero Quest, and then everybody reveals their initiative cards and that determines the order in which people will move starting with the number one. So Jozan would start the game bravely kicking open this door in front of him, which involves flipping that door token over. The initiative cards are dealt out because this is a new room that we've explored. And then the dungeon master will refer to the map and place any monsters and doors as indicated. Let's say that in this room we are going to find two goblins. Here are the goblin miniatures and if we look at the reverse of them, they have little numbers. And the reason they have little numbers is because each monster is its own entity and each monster has its own card for tracking its hit points and things. So this is a nice easy way to indicate which card relates to which monster on the board. We have revealed a room with one treasure chest, one door and two goblins and potentially some traps. And the interesting thing here is the maps don't often specify exactly where monsters are supposed to stand. That is up to the dungeon master to decide. But remember, we don't know the initiative order at this point. The cards have been dealt face down. So when the dungeon master is placing monsters, they have to think. Placing the monsters too close to the door the heroes are coming in through may be putting them in danger, especially if they're not going to activate until much later in the round. However, if you place them too far away and you are early in the initiative order, you may not be able to get involved in the fight in time. So there's a little bit there to think about how to position your monsters in the most effective way. But once the monsters are positioned, you reveal your initiative cards. And let's say our human cleric is first in the initiative order. 
Heroes get two action points per turn, and there are a list of basic actions that every hero can take, and then there are some special actions that only certain heroes can take. Each action takes one of your action points, and there's nothing stopping you doing the same action twice. For example, you can move twice if you need to, or you can attack twice if you don't want to move. Your basic actions are moving, which is moving up to your speed value. In the case of our human cleric, that's five squares. And diagonal movement is not allowed in this game. An action is opening a door, and as soon as you open that door, it effectively resets the initiative track, so you're starting a fresh turn with whatever character has the initiative next. You can use an action to attack with a weapon or spell. You can use an action to open a chest. Or you can use an action to change an item from your hand to your backpack, or from your backpack to your hand. The only exception there is you do not need to do that with potions. You can drink a potion completely for free without spending an action and without having to put it in your hand first. You can drink it straight from your knapsack. These special actions are all listed on the character cards. For example, our cleric can cast the healing spell or can turn undead. Let's start the game by trying to crack a goblin's skull. Jozan has a ranged weapon, the crossbow of faith. And when you are using a ranged weapon, you don't have to worry about distance to the target, but you do have to worry about line of sight, which is center of square to center of square. A hero does not block another hero's line of sight, a monster does not block another monster's line of sight, but they do block line of sight to each other. Of course, walls and doors also block line of sight. So our cleric is going to use his first action to move into the room, and he will use his second action to fire his crossbow of faith. And this is a good time to talk about weapons and their abilities. Looking at our crossbow of faith card, it says when we attack, we roll two yellow dice and the special black star dice. And if we roll a star on the special black star dice, we will get one of our spent spell points back. And the game comes with a range of these different colored dice. And these dice are rolled in different combinations depending on the weapon you are using. The yellow dice is the weakest dice, then the orange dice, then the red, and finally the super powerful purple. And all of the dice have sword symbols on some faces, and then some of the dice also have blanks. The weaker the dice is, the less sword symbols it has, and the more blanks it has. And of course, the swords will represent hits when you're attacking, and the blanks represent misses. So the more powerful weapons will use the red and purple dice, granting you more hits and less chance of fluffing your roll. Additionally, as with the crossbow, sometimes you get to roll this special dice, which is either blank or has the star symbol. Also, some weapons have a special power attack, like the Master's Axe here. We can, if we want to, use the axe normally, rolling one yellow and one orange dice. That's not the strongest attack possible. However, we can instead use the power attack, in which case we roll an additional orange dice, but we also roll that black star dice. And if we roll the star when making the power attack, we lose the weapon. The weapon will break because we have hit someone so hard with it. So with the four different colored dice, the special black dice, special abilities on the cards themselves, and the chance to do these power attacks on certain weapons, the game actually introduces a lot of different variety in what weapons can do. It's a little bit more involved than something like the hero quest roll to hit, roll to block. In fact, in this game, there's no rolling to block at all. Instead, it's all fixed values involving armor class. Let's assume the cleric has rolled really well. He has rolled two hits and he has also rolled a star. He would, if he had spent any spell points, recover one spell point at this point. We then have to look at the stat card for the goblins that we have attacked. And we can see we have some fixed values here. We have an armor class of one, we have four wounds, we have a movement of five, and then we have a close combat attack rolling two yellow and one orange dice. So we can see that when the goblins activate, they're going to be scurrying up to us and rolling yellow and orange dice in an attempt to hit us. But the way it works attacking them, we literally take the armor class value of one off of the total number of hits we rolled, which is two, and that is the number of wounds we have inflicted. So we have inflicted a single wound on the goblin. The goblin has three wounds remaining and is a little bit annoyed with us. But it's okay because our elven wizard is going to activate next and she has a very powerful spell at her disposal. She starts with magic missile. Let's assume she has moved into the room next to our cleric there and she now wants to cast a spell on the same goblin that he attacked. Spells work the same way as weapons, except you have to cast them using spell points. The symbols down the left-hand side of the card indicate the casting cost for the wizard, and then below that, the casting cost for a cleric. So this will cost our elven wizard two spell points to cast. And down at the bottom of the card, we can see it is a ranged attack, 
and it will roll one yellow and one red dice. So that is a much more powerful attack. Because unlike the yellow dice, the red dice goes up to three swords total. So this single attack could inflict four wounds, which taking off the armor class of one for the goblin would be enough to kill it. So let's just assume we're having a good day and we do succeed in killing the goblin. Unfortunately, the third card in the initiative order went to the dungeon master, which means now the goblin gets to retaliate. As with heroes, monsters all get two action points, but they don't get free reign on how to use them. They can either use them to move and attack, or attack then move, or move twice. They don't get the option of attacking twice. Other than that, it's exactly the same process. He would move adjacent to one of the heroes. He would roll the attack dice listed on his card, two yellow dice and one orange dice in this case. We would subtract the cleric's armor class of two from the total number of hit points, and that's the number of wounds we would take. And that's combat, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward, but there are still a lot of interesting things in there, the different dice with the different colors, the special dice you can roll sometimes, the chance of using a power attack on certain weapons, casting spells, knowing when to use your spell points, knowing when to use an item like the crossbow of faith that has the potential to restore those spell points. There's quite a few things to think about, and the dice system for the combat introduces enough different options that all of the weapons you find feel a little bit different. Up to now we have talked about movement, opening doors, combat with weapons and spells, and changing items to and from our knapsack. There's one more basic action, which is opening a treasure chest. To open a treasure chest you have to move onto the chest and have a spare action available to be able to open it. If you don't have that second action available, you cannot move onto the chest. Let's assume our cleric is going to open this chest. He moves onto the token, and now he has to draw a card from the treasure deck. And this is a good opportunity to talk about the treasure deck and how it is generated. The game includes five different types of cards. There are spells, weapons, artifacts, potions, and the dreaded booby traps. And they are numbered from one to three depending on the level. So at the start of each game you play, the dungeon master will collect all of the cards that are relating to the level of the adventure you're playing and shuffle them together to form the treasure deck. Whenever a hero opens a treasure chest, they take the top card from that deck, so they might find a spell, a weapon, an artifact, a potion, or a booby trap might hit them. And of course, because these cards are graded from one to three, as you progress through the campaign, you will find nicer weapons and tougher booby traps. This one's a fun booby trap. When you activate it, all living creatures in the room lose one hit point, but it does not affect the undead. Once you have opened the treasure chest, it is removed from the board. The only exception here is if there is a special artifact in the treasure chest and that information will be included on the map in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Next, we need to talk about some of the special actions that are only relevant to certain characters. First, while we're still talking about the Cleric, let's talk about his healing ability and his turn undead ability. His healing ability is very straightforward. You spend an action, you then spend a number of spell points and you recover hit points equal to the number of spell points you have spent. You can do that on yourself or you can do it on an adjacent hero. His other ability is turn undead, and no, that doesn't mean that he himself turns undead. And he gets his own cool special dice for doing this ability. It has skulls, double skulls, and triple skulls, but it also has some blanks. And the way it works is if you're going to turn undead, you will look at the monster card for the undead enemy in question. Here we have a skeleton, and you can see on the left hand side, the skeleton has a little skull symbol with a one next to it. That means in order to turn this undead skeleton, you need to roll at least one skull on your turn undead dice. And if you're successful, the undead monster misses its next turn. Next up we have the halfling rogue, and she is the only character who can search for traps. And when you search for traps, you roll a special dice. And this dice has an eye symbol on it, it has a double eye symbol on it, it has a hand, and it has blank sides. And to search for traps, you spend an action and you roll that dice. If you roll the eye symbol, you will reveal the closest trap to you. The dungeon master has to place the token on the board based on where there are traps on the map, like so. If you roll the double eye symbol, you get to reveal the two closest traps, like so. If you roll the blank, you don't reveal any traps, but that doesn't mean there were no traps to find. Fortunately, you can continue spending actions and continue searching until you roll the hand symbol. Once you roll the hand symbol, you have to stop searching. You have given up and you have assumed there are no more traps. Again, that doesn't mean there are no more traps to find, it just means you didn't find them. Of course, once you have found a trap, 
you get to try and disable it if you want to. To do that, the rogue has to stand on the trap, putting herself in danger. And you then roll the special Disable Trap dice. Five sides of the dice have the Disable Trap icon, which means you have successfully disabled the trap and everything is fine. But one side of the dice has the explosion symbol. If you get this, the trap goes off. And the game has all kinds of different traps. There are pit traps where you fall down and lose one hit point, evil resurrection traps, which will restore the last monster you killed to life, fireball traps, poison dart traps, snarling root traps, and strangling creepers traps. Those all sound like a fun time. Those are the most involved special rules. There are a few more. The Halfling Rogue also has a sneak ability, which allows her to move through enemy monsters. If she does that and then attacks the enemy monster, she gets to add one success to her dice roll. The wizard, of course, gets to cast spells and her armor class goes up or down based on how many spell points she has at any point. And the human fighter just gets to add one success to combat attacks. And really, that's it for this game. It's as simple as that. One character will open the door, you shuffle up the initiative cards, the dungeon master lays out the next room that you find, making sure they keep any traps hidden and secret. You reveal the initiative cards, you activate in order, taking your two actions. You fight through the monsters, you loot treasure chests, you reveal traps, and you genuinely have a fun time. And hopefully from talking through the rules like this, it is apparent why I think of this a little bit like an advanced hero quest more so than advanced hero quest is because it is still a very simple game like Hero Quest, but there's just a few extra things going on. There's a lot more items, the weapons do a lot more different things, there's more special abilities, spell casting is a bit more involved because you're constantly juggling with the spell points, and if you're the wizard, having no spell points means you also have no armor class, which makes you very susceptible to attacks. The initiative order keeps things fresh, you never know when the dungeon master is going to activate next. I think it does miss out on a few things that Hero Quest does, there are no secret doors to find. You can't collect money and spend money between adventures. That's just not something you can do here. You can keep your weapons between quests that you find. So if you find something decent, but of course, as you go up through the levels, you're going to start needing more powerful weapons. So eventually the equipment you have becomes less useful. And that's something that never really happens in Hero Quest. If you've got a broadsword in Hero Quest, it's always a decent thing to have. There's certainly a little bit more to think of overall. And there are some interesting monsters to face, all lifted from Dungeons and Dragons. Goblins, bugbears, ogres, trolls, probably my favourite, the carrion crawlers, skeletons, zombies, gnolls, wraiths, and the terrifying lich. I could probably talk about this game for quite some time. I think it's wonderful. And it did have, as I mentioned before, two expansions. Eternal Winter, which introduced a barbarian and seems very, very similar to HeroQuest's expansion Frozen Horror. And then there was the Forbidden Forest, which introduced more outside locations and a druid hero. But I think I'm going to leave it here for now. I hope you've enjoyed this little look at this old classic. I am going to be doing a playthrough on the channel, hopefully very, very soon indeed. And I hope you check that out as well. But that's it from me for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, please consider pressing the like button. If you really enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully I'll see you all again very soon. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye.